Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Game Vitacom video, we're going to be investigating Intel's EMIB, also known as Embedded Multi Die Interconnect Bridge. Yes, you can see why they went with the acronym, can't you? For those unfamiliar with this technology, it is, in essence, Intel's answer to AMD's Glue, also known as Infinity Fabric. It is the complete and total logical conclusion now that chips are becoming so damn complex. When we look at the older chips, which were monolithic designs, although they did have distinct components, they would have CPU cores, of course, they would have memory controllers and other I.O., they would naturally have graphics cores or whatever else was required of them, they were essentially part of one large-ass die. The problem with that is the bigger the chip, well, as you can imagine, the greater the chance of defects. Sure, you can, of course, do the whole thing of binning those chips and subjecting them to yields. In other words, let's say you are producing a four-core processor, two of those cores are defective, well, guess what? You now have a dual-core CPU that you can sell to customers, and naturally this lowers the cost, because you're not simply scrapping those chips. But as designs become increasingly complex, and naturally we also need chips to do an increasingly wider gamut of tasks, it becomes fairly obvious that we need a different design approach. Now I have already tackled Infinity Fabric, so if you have watched that video you'll have at least some understanding of what Intel were doing when they were creating EMIP, but I'm going to give you the long and short of it in this particular video as well. You can also think of a heterogeneous, heterogeneous design, excuse me, as almost like Lego, and you're slotting those pieces of Lego to form a greater whole. So this design allows you to combine multiple components, multiple CPUs, whatever, and simply connect them all together with a fast interconnect, which of course serves as a communication between these different components, and this solves multiple problems. The first is that as I said, it increases yields, because yes, of course, you are naturally still going to have the odd chip which is damaged when you've slotted all of those parts together. It might just be, you know, someone drops it when they're producing it, or more likely you're going to have defects on the smaller chips. But because they are just the smaller chips, they cost less money to produce. There is another benefit to this as well. It allows the CPU to be produced with different components being produced on different processors. So for example, let's say the CPU core is shrunk down to 10 nm, but let's say they haven't quite gotten around to it with the graphics core, let's say that's still on a 14 nm process, well that's no problem. You can simply slot those together. And the last big benefit, and one that I hinted at earlier, as technology advances and as your clients need differ, well, you need to create products which better are able to be customized to those needs. Think of it much like uh, AMD did with Sony and Microsoft, where Microsoft said to them with the Scorpio, hey, we need to hit this performance metric, we need to do it within this power budget, and we also need it within this cost as well. What can you do? And then, of course, AMD hit them back and said, okay, these are the components that we have available. Here's what we can do. These are the, probably the, you know, the clock speeds that we can run with this particular set of processors. And then naturally it was tweaked. Much the same with um, the PlayStation 4 Pro, where its GPU was almost cherry-picked. Parts of Vega were plopped in. Parts of the older architecture were plopped in. And then they also used the older Jaguar CPUs to power it. It is imperative to know that, yes, AMD have already embraced this. We've already seen it with Vega, and we're most likely going to be seeing it even further with Navi. AMD also using it for Epic and Fred Ripper as well. And NVIDIA also jumping in on the act as well with Volta. But there are multiple different ways of creating a heterogeneous type of uh, processor. There are multi-chip packages, Silicon Interposer, and the EMIP. Once again, Embedded multi die Interconnect Bridge. Going quickly through... The other two options, multi-chip packaging, well, it has a few problems. The first is that you are connecting the dies through the package substrate itself. However, you have poor connection density, and where the connections meet, you also have a, a low amount of die-to-die -die interconnects as well. This basically limits connectivity options and performance. 
The second option is better from a performance standpoint. You have Silicon Interposer. Now, it's great for density of die-to-die -die connections, great for die-to-die uh, -die interconnects, which is obviously a good thing. But, unfortunately, you have cost to concern yourself with this. This is typically a 2.5D packaging. Now, how this works is essentially you have a thin layer of silicon, and this is essentially sitting between the die and the package substrate. In other words, you can think of this as a set of wires, if you will, which goes between the two dies. We've seen this very much in, well, technology in the vein of this with like high bandwidth memory as well, where you have the HBM memory sitting on the substrate, and then you've got the CPU as well, and basic, I'm sorry, the GPU as well, and basically all of those are connected with, once again, you can just think of them as little wires which go into each CPU component or whatever else it needs to do. Naturally, Intel are claiming that they have the better piece of technology. EMIB has good density, good density of die-to-die -die and die-to-bridge connections, but, and this is the important thing, it fixes the issue with the silicon interposer. Not a technical issue, but more a logistics issue, the cost. Obviously, price is a problem. If customers, that is, end customers, or whether that's um, you as the person buying it in the store, or whether that's AMD or whomever else need to pay more money to produce this thing, obviously that's a bad thing. So one of the benefits of this is its lower cost. The other positive with this as well is that you have a smaller pitch. This means that if you were to continue to improve this technology, because currently it's at just 55 nm, that's nanometers of course, it can continue to go up. For example, eventually it could go to 10 micron, um, it could go to 10. And this, of course, means that you are able to uh, improve connectivity further. This leads to the other positive, which is that Intel can package these dies within 100 microns of one another. What does this mean? Well, you are reducing the space between components. This means that you don't need to suck up so much juice to transmit signals. The other benefit, of course, is a pretty obvious one. You can put together packages in a smaller area. So you can either more densely populate something, or you can simply have a smaller chip in the first place. So Intel are working with partners to develop what it is calling chiplets. These are essentially reusable blocks, which can be for processors, receivers, memory controls, any other components it needs, and then Intel can essentially match those to create custom designs, which is pretty much what I said a few moments ago. Intel are being a bit cagey on all of the details, but it does say that a lot of the technical stuff is essentially abstracted away. If you're familiar with high-level APIs, for example, DirectX 11, where you don't need to code straight to the I guess, straight to the metal, it's very much similar. In other words, the more complex stuff is just, you know, you don't need to worry about. All you need to do is worry about the overall design. The only thing that Intel have really uh, given us information of is the, the fact that the interfaces themselves will support up to 2 GBPS per physical line. This means eventually you can create some very interesting types of combinations. You could put together a CPU type of machine learning algorithm, which naturally would have high bandwidth memory or other types of a massive amounts of local cache, perhaps a processor which is designed for deep learning. You could do pretty much whatever you want. Now, obviously, Intel are planning to expand this to other products and... Well, let's just be honest here. The logical way for it to go is Xeons. Because, well, they are something that the clients would certainly be very happy with. Imagine being able to customize your Xeon and saying, hey, we want this number of cores. Or, hey, you know, our applications really would benefit if we had a large amount of high bat, if we had a large amount of HBM on there. Or let's say that they want to once again go the deep learning route, in which case they could perhaps have some type of machine learning ASIC. But unfortunately, Intel are not exactly being very forthcoming when it comes to the timeline. So one area we can certainly see them really pushing this 
is also X-Point. Now, of course, X-Point is another technology that we've talked about a couple of times before on the channel. If you do want more information on it, then you can just simply search uh, Red Gaming Tech X-Point and it will pop up. Essentially, this is not... The best way I can describe this uh, as like a closing as a closing synopsis is this is not this is not new as in like this is going to be a revolutionary piece of technology which is going to suddenly decimate all this is not them creating the first gpu where obviously beforehand they were not programmable this was not them creating the first cpu instead think of it as a way to create a technology which is more long lasting Think of it as a way to continue Moore's Law and the fine tradition with Moore's Law. Think of it as a way to circumvent some of the limitations of the larger dies and perhaps get the bit, the best out of both worlds. With that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. Uh, as I said, it was kind of an overview because they've not released all of the details yet, unfortunately. But do stick with us for more. With all of that said, take care of yourselves. Bye for now.